Hey guys, it is Wednesday, so time to talk about the Bible for a few minutes. We are going to continue talking about God and who God is and what it means for God to say that He is the I Am, the God who is present, um, Yahweh, Jehovah, what is intrinsic to that name. We've been talking about how um, for God in Exodus 6 and in Exodus 3 and in Exodus 2, for God to call Himself that, to say that is His name, to reveal Himself as the God who is present is essentially to hear the cry that comes out of the darkness, to care about that cry, to answer that cry. And in answering that cry, what he does is um, <clears throat> God goes head to head with the powers that be over the um, powers that be over the darkness and brings liberation from that. And so we've been exploring various things. If this is truly central to God's character, as this book of Exodus seems to argue, something we want to pay attention to. We found it at a variety of places in the Old Testament story and in the New Testament story. And today I want to kind of start to broaden our search a little bit and look at some things that uh, may not have that exact Exodus language, but thematically is pushing the same sort of thing. It's going to open us to some new ways of looking at things. Uh, and particularly it's going to lead us to this question we've kind of been asking and giving hints of answers that all along. Um, how do we follow such a God, right? So I want to do a little storytelling today, uh, this week from Exodus 7, 8, and 9. And then next week we're going to do a little more storytelling from Exodus. And the reason we're telling these two, or not Exodus, Isaiah 7, 8, and 9, I have Exodus on the brain. Uh, and the reason we're going to do um, the storytelling is because these are particularly two texts that Matthew uses in the opening chapters of his Gospels. It's going to come up in chapter 1, it's going to come up in chapter 2, it's going to come up in chapter 3, and in chapter 4. Or, yep, yeah, I think I've got that right. Chapter uh, chapter 1, 3, and 4, rather, not chapter 2 necessarily, although that carries over from 1. Uh, he uses these two stories as a way of contextualizing and shaping who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing in the world. And you're going to find some familiar themes. So I just want to take some time to tell the story. And I've told this story before. I think it's been a while. Uh, a lot of you may not have heard it. Many of you may not remember it. If you do remember it, let this repetition be kind of a sign that... Uh, this is something that needs to be emphasized. It's a fairly big deal for Matthew. It's a fairly big deal in Isaiah and the way the New Testament is working. And so uh, we begin in Isaiah chapter 7. And we're not going to go through it in any great detail. I'm just going to kind of tell you the story and draw out some things. And uh, I want to encourage you to sit down and read Isaiah 7, 8, and 9 as we go, or as you have some time a little bit later. But Isaiah 7, if you start back up in uh, verse 1, it begins in the reign of Ahaz. Ahaz is the king in Jerusalem. And this is a point in their history where <clears throat> um, this is a point in their history where Jerusalem and Judah to the south has already had experienced a split from the tribes of Israel in the north. So you have the ten tribes in the northern half that have split from Judah and Benjamin in the southern half. You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And so just north of Jerusalem, of Judah, where Ahaz reigns, you have the Israelites. And uh, their king is going to play a major role in the story. And then just north of them, you have the Syrians. And their king is going to play a major role in the story. And you want to make sure, and I'm going to try to enunciate this clearly enough, we want to make sure that we're differentiating between the Syrians and the Assyrians because they're both going to play a role in the story. So what's going on at the beginning of Isaiah 7 is Ahaz finds out that the uh, Israelite king to the north and then the Syrian king to the north of them, they have teamed up and they are uh, concocting a plot to overthrow him in Jerusalem to install a puppet king who is going to do what they say. And so he's got this problem that he's facing. And it's about this time that he's coming to realize what this problem is, that um, Isaiah the prophet comes to him and says, you don't really need to worry about this problem. God is going to handle the Israelites, and God is going to handle the Syrians. This is just going to be a flash in the pan. And to demonstrate to you, Isaiah goes on to say, to demonstrate to you that this is not really going to be that much of an issue, God will give you a sign. Ask for anything, however great or however small. He will give you a sign of his faithfulness so that you can rest assured that he is going to take care of this issue. Now, Ahaz, you may remember from uh, growing up in Bible school, and if you don't, I'll tell you now, Ahaz was a rotten king. Um, he was faithless, he was inept, he was wicked. All of the bad adjectives that we could assign to a king in the biblical history, we can assign those to Ahaz. He was among the worst. And so what Ahaz does here in the face of Isaiah's offer 
his reassurances that God is going to take care of this problem. Basically what he does is he responds with faithlessness. He, he feigns piety. He says, oh, I would never uh, dare presume to test the Lord. And he refuses to ask for a sign. But he's already got a plan cooking. In other words, what Ahaz is doing is he's refusing to trust God to take care of the situation as God says he would take care of the situation. And so this is where, by the way, Isaiah says, well, God's going to give you a sign anyway. Kind of gestures to the side of the room. There's this maiden. The maiden is going to give birth to a child. And before this child is old enough to um, tell right from wrong, a, uh, Israel and Syria are not going to be problems anymore because God is going to take care of business. But at this point, what Ahaz is doing is he's kind of uh, shoving Isaiah to the side. He's kind of dismissing the sign of the maiden and the child. He, he's dismissing God from the situation. Uh, he doesn't have time for any of that. So what Ahaz does is, rather, he goes and, and the, the books of history in the Old Testament kind of uh, spell this out more. Um, but he goes rather, instead of trusting God, he goes rather to the Assyrian Empire and enters into an alliance with them. Uh, the Assyrians at this time were the biggest bullies in the world. They were the superpower on the block, a global superpower. Um, their empire was vast. They were bloodthirsty and merciless. They were cruel beyond measure. Their lust for conquest was uh, boundless. So he goes to the Assyrians because everybody knows in the world when you have a bully, or in Ahaz's case, a set of bullies, the way you handle a bully is you find a bigger bully. And so he goes off and he finds a bigger bully. He enters into um, an alliance with the Assyrians to solve this problem that God had offered to solve for him. And it's at that point that Isaiah comes back to Ahaz. In the last half of chapter 7, all of chapter 8 deal with this kind of response to what Ahaz has done, his, his faithlessness, his trusting in Assyria rather than in the Lord. He comes back to him and he says, you have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. Uh, you have no idea the door that you have opened for the future of your people because the Assyrians are going to be the Assyrians. They're going to do their thing. And you think that they're going to come in and they're going to just take over the uh, the Syrians, the Assyrians take over the Syrians, and they're going to take over the Israelites, and that's what you want them to do. But they got you too, man. And so by the time everything is said and done, we come down to the end of chapter 8, and I just want to read you a little bit of this. Uh, we come down to the end of chapter 8, and I'm scrolling down to it. Uh, Isaiah paints this really stark picture of what life is going to be like because of Ahaz's decision. Uh, I'm just going to start in verse 21 and read down to the end of the chapter. This is Isaiah chapter uh, 8 going from 21 down to the end. It says, And it will pass through it distressed and hungry, and this shall happen. When it is hungry, it will be enraged, and it will curse its king and its gods, and it will face upward or look to the earth. But look, this is where I want you to pay attention. Distress and darkness, the gloom of affliction, and it will be thrust into darkness. And so it's kind of a summary of this running commentary Isaiah has been giving for the last um, chapter and a half. Because you've opened the door to the Assyrians, because you've rejected God and you've decided to go with the biggest bully on the block, prepare to be bullied yourself. And <clears throat> you're going to be conquered, and there's going to be violence, and there's going to be oppression, and there's going to be suffering, and there's going to be darkness and gloom. And at the end of the day, all you're going to be left with is affliction and distress and darkness. And so what I want to do for a second is I want to pause the story right here and I want us to think about what is going on because there's something, there's something paradigmatic going on here. There's something um, happening in this story that is common to the experience that we have just as humans. It's a very human story. So far you have um, four active players in this story. All of them are kings. We're not counting for the moment the maiden. We're not counting Isaiah. We're not counting the child who's going to be born because they've all kind of been shoved to the side. We're not counting God either for that matter because he's kind of been dismissed. Ahaz has no room for him in this situation. But you have four kings. You have Ahaz, the king of Jerusalem. You have the king of Israel. You have the king of Syria. You have the king, the emperor of Assyria. And uh, in the biblical economy, what kings were meant to do is to represent the goodness and the agenda of God. 
And so uh, you'll remember that initially God was king in Israel, but they didn't want God to be king. They wanted another king. And so the way it was kind of set up is the king is there to represent um, my agenda, God would say. And so we might say that what kings are meant to do is work for the flourishing, uh, the full humanity of the people in their care. They are stewards. And so they're supposed to be working for the good of their people, the blessing of their people, the nourishing of their people, the flourishing of their people. They're supposed to be working so that they can live into the full humanity and the goodness that God intended for them. But in a broken world where um, sin has opened the door to death and death reigns and all roads lead to death, what we find most often is, I say most often, what we find always is that we uh, end up with kings like Ahaz and the Israelite king and the Syrian king and the Assyrian king. That is, rather than leading to the goodness and the blessing and the flourishing and the nourishment of their people, uh, rather in various ways seeking their own agendas um, through their own failings, even when they try their best through their own ineptitude, what, what we find is they um, reflect the brokenness and the darkness of the world. And so it is precisely in Isaiah 7 and 8, the end result of the actions of these four kings who are supposed to be working for the good of their people, that the people end up in gloom and distress and oppression and affliction. This violence, this suffering, this oppression, all of it comes from the actions of these four kings who are supposed to be working for the blessings of those people. And if you stop and you think about it for more than just a few minutes, you're going to realize that this is a common story throughout all of history. This is not unique to Judah. This is not unique to Israel or Syria or even Assyria. This is just the way things work. Um, today is Inauguration Day, so it, it provides a perfect opportunity to think about that. For the last four years, we have had a variation on this story that Isaiah tells in Isaiah 7 and 8. And um, I need you to hear this clearly, for the eight years before that, we had a variation on the story that Isaiah tells in Isaiah 7 and 8. And if you want to trace that even further back, every leader of every nation throughout the history of the world is going to give us some variation of the story that Isaiah tells in Isaiah 7 and 8. Because through Isaiah 7 and 8, what he's doing is he's telling a story about how rulers nations, how power works in a broken world that is controlled by death, where all roads lead to death. This is just the way things are. We are looking for flourishing. We're looking for uh, the good life. We're looking for a way to lean into all of the good things that God intended for us. But we live in a broken world. And so even at their best, leaders are going to come up short of that goal. We're going to see this more clearly next week in um, Isaiah 36 through 40 when we look at the second story. Um, but here we don't even see um, a best case scenario. What we find more often is we have leaders who just aren't really interested in doing the sorts of things that make for the sort of world that God wants. And so we end up with distress and darkness and those sorts of things. And if you think about it, that's why, at least in my lifetime, and I've, I've read some historical research that would suggest it's been this way a lot longer, um, that's why, at least in my lifetime, every election is the most important election in the world. Um, certainly, that's the way we have phrased or framed, rather, this one. That's the way we framed the last one. And every time it seems, you know, this is the most important election we've ever had, everything depends on this election. Either everything is going to get better if you vote for my person, or things are going to get worse if you vote for the other person. And one of the reasons why every election is important, why we think every election matters, why everyone is the most important one in the history of the world is no matter how much you like the person in office before this election, no matter how high your hopes were for that person, you come to the end of their term and those old perennial problems that speak to the brokenness and the darkness of the world, they're all still there. Even for our best attempts, even in our best intentioned efforts, all of those problems still exist. And so there's, there's still poverty. 
and there's still violence and there's still oppression and there's still addiction and there's still um, all manner of injustice that happens and this list could go on and on and on and on for all of our promises what history has shown us is most of the promises we make about making the world a better place they end up being empty promises at least on the level of leadership and so um, every leader or regardless of what they do with it, regardless of where they come from, or regardless of whether they're good or they're bad, um, every leader inherits a broken world. Every leader will, in some way, make some contributions to make that a slightly better place, but they will also contribute to the brokenness of the world. Um, it's one of the reasons why, no matter who's taking office, I'm always kind of interested, even as an Anabaptist who doesn't typically be tend to be political in the, the way the American system thinks of being political, I get interested on inauguration days. Like, okay, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go with this? What's going to happen? But one of the things that the Bible always calls us back to is, no matter what they do, and no matter what happens in the brokenness of the world, this person sitting in this office, in this city, in this nation, with these powers vested in them, they're not going to be able to take us to where we want to go. It's always going to end up being some version of the story that we have in Isaiah 7 and 8. And this sometimes can happen because they are wicked, evil, malicious, selfish people with their own agenda. It can also happen with those who are um, coming at the situation with the best of intentions and people of character who just fall under the weight of the struggle to make the world a better, better place. They just can't carry the weight on their shoulders that has been placed there. Um, we always I use we here as humanity. You know, life may be good for me, but not necessarily for my neighbor. We always end up with some variation on doom, distress, and darkness. And so what I want you to see is that through um, the end of chapter 8 in Isaiah, what we have going on is a story that is very similar to what was happening in Exodus. And a story that is very similar to what was happening in Jesus' day as the Israelites were under the thumb of the Roman rulers and the corrupt local rulers, people like Herod and the Sanhedrin, who were more self-interested oftentimes uh, than they were in taking care of the people around them. It's a situation where in the darkness and the distress and the anguish, that cry would go out as people experienced the darkness. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And it is certainly the case we're going to find in Isaiah that God who revealed himself as the I am in the book of Exodus, God who heard Abel's blood crying from the ground, God who answers the cry in, in places uh, like the Psalms, God who answers the cry in places like Revelation, uh, God in Isaiah is going to hear that cry. And so in the midst of the darkness, at the end of Isaiah chapter 8, what Isaiah does is he looks forward to um, a future situation. He tells a story about a future time. And in that time, he, he starts off with this, um, this word, but. Verse 1 of chapter 9, but you're going to have distress and darkness and gloom and affliction and you'll be thrust into darkness, but um, there will be no gloom for those who were in distress, he says in verse 1 of chapter 9. In the former times, the times he'd been describing in chapter 7 and 8, where this is the way the world works and this is the world we are accustomed to, where um, leaders are incapable or unwilling to keep the sorts of promises that we draw out of them or that they make in an effort to gain power. Uh, in the former times, he treated the land of Zebulun and Naphtali with contempt, but in the future, he will honor the way of the sea beyond the Jordan of Galilee, or the, the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Um, listen to what he says here. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Light has shined on those who lived in a land of darkness. This is the darkness he has been describing, uh, brought about at the hands of those four kings in chapter 7 and 8. A light is going to shine on that land. Those who lived in darkness will have a great light shining on them. And um, he says in verse 3, You've made the nations numerous. You have not made the joy great. They rejoice in your presence with joy as with joy at the harvest, as they rejoice when they divide plunder. 
For you have shattered the yoke of its burden and the stick of its shoulder, the rod of its oppressor on the day of Midian. For every boot that marches and shakes the earth and garment rolled in blood will be for burning fire fuel. Um, down through the end of verse 5, this, this light breaking in on darkness. Those who live in darkness will have this light and joy will break out. And this imagery of victory and this imagery of liberation and this imagery of the reversal of all of the things that it's been talking about in Isaiah 7 and 8 brought on by the inept rulers. And we might ask the question down through verse 5, how is all of this going to happen? Um, certainly, I'm interested in this happening. Um, how does it come about? And so the answer he gives in verse 6, For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and the dominion will be on his shoulder. I want you to think about how we talked a minute ago, how uh, the leaders of the world, good or bad, are in between, and most of them are a mix. They're somewhere in between. Uh, they ultimately fail because they can't bear the weight that has been placed on their shoulders. But it says, this child that is going to be born, this son that is given to us, dominion will be placed on his shoulders. And ultimately, he's going to be able to bear the weight. His name is called Wonderful, and he is Counselor, and he is Mighty God, and he is Everlasting Father. He is Prince of Peace, and his dominion will grow continually. And his authority, his reign, the area over which he has influence and resides will, will expand. And to peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to sustain it with justice and righteousness now and forever, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do this. Notice that last line. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts. Yahweh. It's the name he gave at the um, burning bush. It's the name he emphasized in Exodus 6. The I am, the God who is present, the one who hears the cry that comes out of the darkness, enters into the darkness, goes to war with the powers of be over the darkness, and liberates people from the darkness. The God who is present is going to do this. And he is going to do this in this description here by becoming this child. First, it's just a child is born to us, a son is given, but by the time it's done, he is eternal father, he is mighty God. And, and, and so God himself is going to come in this royal position. He is going to become king. And all of the ways that the um, leaders and rulers, the kings and the presidents and the prime ministers of our world, uh, for not for lack of trying, sometimes have got it wrong, God is going to get it right. And so it says that it's going to be characterized not only by joy or light breaking into darkness, but it's going to be characterized by peace. And peace in the Old Testament is more than just the absence of violence. You know, sometimes um, we think that peace is just this absence of violence where, you know, I would really like to hit you and you would really like to hit me, but we're not hitting each other right now, so that's peace. Um, peace in the Old Testament, shalom, the Hebrew word for it, is... Um, a communal well-being, what you have when things work the way they're supposed to work. It's very akin to this notion of righteousness that he talks about a little while later. Righteousness is what's going on when things are working the way they're supposed to. It's a product of reconciliation. It's a product of, of mending those old wounds. It's a product of setting the world right. He says, so his reign of peace will never end. He will bring justice and he will bring righteousness. Those two twin terms that we'll talk about more as we go along. But, you know, it's about setting the world right and getting things back to the way they're supposed to be. Uh, the way things should be rather than just the way things are. He says God is going to come as king um, in the form of this child. And where we're used to kings like Ahaz and the Israelite king and the Syrian king and the Assyrian king, where we're used to doom and anguish and those sorts of things as humanity. Uh, the brokenness of the world where injustice reigns and unrighteousness reigns and that we have war rather than peace and we have sorrow rather than joy and we have darkness rather than light. God is going to come and he's going to set things right and he's going to do this as the God who is present, as the God who hears the cries that come out of that darkness that we're accustomed to. Isaiah is telling an Exodus story. It's not Exodus in any strict or formal sense, but the themes are all there. It's the same sort of thing. We have entered into this long darkness. We are accustomed to the brokenness. We have um, <clears throat> no expectation of our leaders being able to give us or ourselves as a people being able to give us anything other than the brokenness. But God is going to, Isaiah says, at some future time, he's dreaming a dream. Um, some future time he's going to come and he's going to do what we can't. 
He's going to set right what we have broken and we have failed to fix. He is going to, to set the world to rights. And so he's telling this Exodus story and why it's important is because in Matthew's gospel, and we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about this more after we do the story from Isaiah next week, the, the second story from Isaiah, uh, is after in Matthew's gospel, he's going to turn precisely to this story uh, in chapter 1 and in chapter 4. And he's going to say, in essence, this is the story you need to pay attention to in order to make sense of Jesus's story. You remember that dream that Isaiah had about the way things would be one day and everybody from the midst of the brokenness of the Roman Empire with all of the oppression and the boot on their neck and all that. They said, oh, yeah, we remember that dream, that dream. We can't wait for that to happen. And Matthew says it's happening. In Jesus, it's happening. And so Matthew is going to pick up Isaiah's story, point to it and say, that's what Jesus is doing. And that's what Jesus is doing, Isaiah reminds us, because that's who God is. And so we want to just continue going down the road. All right, so I just clicked over to 26 minutes. Um, my lunch time is about half over, so I'm going to go get some other things done. Remember, this is not recorded live. If you want to leave a question or comment, that sort of thing, you can, and we will uh, discuss it as we go. I'd love to hear, hear your feedback, your comments, those sorts of things. You can text me, you can private message me, whatever you want to do. Um, but we will keep trucking. I hope you guys are having a great week, and um, we miss seeing you guys. Hope we can see you again sooner rather than later, but until then, we're pulling for you way over here. and hope things are well for you way over there. Take it easy.